we go. We're going to be talking about being developed through the ordinary. What is something that is just your ordinary? It's something you have to do all day, every day. You don't particularly enjoy it, but it is simply part of your daily life. It's what God has given you simply to do. Work. <laughs> Work. Okay. <laughs> You're not crazy about it, I can tell. <laughs> clean. Clean. We have Yeah, clean the dishes, clean, you know, every time I paint or I set up for painting, I don't have a studio where I can just like leave the schmutz everywhere. Mm. I have to pull I'm pulling everything up and I've got a system and I've got to okay, rearrange it and <clears throat> I don't particularly like it, but Cleaning, you know, and washing right. the dishes and mm -hmm. whatever. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That bright light was too much. Uh, I think uh, I think even something as simple as like taking the dog out. Do you always want to get mm -hmm. up early? Do you always want to get up early at the beck and call of a child or a dog? Mm -hmm. No, sometimes you really want to sleep in. Mm -hmm. But I have found that oftentimes when I'm like stumbling around half awake at six in the morning to take her out when she really has to go. Normally I have her mm -hmm. structure. I walk, I open the door and I, and I just have to just take a breath and say, thank you for this day. Yes. You know? And that, in that moment when we don't want to do it, that's when we're with him, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or he is with us. Yes. Okay. We all have it. I mean, obviously we can't live life without the everyday mundane, ordinary, you know, but yet the world is all about the spectacular, the amazing yeah. And it can make us feel a certain way. We can look at our lives and go, uh -huh. work, clean, walk the dog, you know? And it's just like, uh, same old, same old. Like mm -hmm. when I were to ask you, what are you going to do this how? What are you going to do for the 4th of July? Everybody wants to have something wonderful to say, you know? But mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. most cases, we're like, uh, you know, I might throw something on a grill or, you know. No, ma'am. Sleep. <laughs> I'm going to sleep because I already did my work for the independence of this, of this country. So I'm good. <laughs> I've already celebrated it, done it, laid it out on the field and had it on the operating room. So I'm, <laughs> but wouldn't sleeping. it be wonderful if we honestly, thank you, Shannon, if we could just really live in that and be okay. Mm. There's something, there's a pressure that I yes. think most of us live under in the world today Yes, that wants to be grand. I want to do something spectacular. I want to, you know, and we feel like we're not meeting up to the, you know, we're not doing our part. If all I can say is I'm just going to sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to cuddle with my dog, you mm -hmm. know? So we find ourselves oh, stressing ourselves out yeah. trying to meet up to what we think everyone else is doing. And social media obviously doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So as I was studying, going through some stuff this week, God, what God put on my heart was, I want you to find the blessing in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Fall in love with the ordinary, the every day, and not go in search of all the wonderful this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like we're constantly looking for the goosebumps, what gives me goosebumps. Mm-hmm. And if we're trying to find God in the goosebumps, most times we're going to miss God yeah, because he's not in there. So really what we're going to look at tonight are all of the ordinaries. There's lots of suddenlies in scripture, immediately this or suddenly that. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example? Any, anything, any story in the scripture where suddenly God did something or immediately this happened? While Elijah, no, while I, oh, hold on. While Hezekiah was praying and crying out to the Lord, the Lord sent Isaiah back, was it Isaiah back and told him, while he was still praying, God said this, so tell me what you want me, what, what do you want him to do for you? Yes, and immediately, right? Give me another. Think about it. What are some immediately or some sudden? I have one. Tabney. When Jesus was asleep on the boat and everybody was dropping everything off the boat and panicking, he woke up and he was, I'm just trying to get a nap. 
it's why y'all worried about this storm and this wind and and suddenly immediately <laughs> it was calm he calmed it yes yes thank you another great one any others we can think of cindy um well oh sorry no, no, please go. I, I just Cindy, and then I'll see. Sh okay. I saw Cindy, and then I'll go to Shannon, and then I'll come back to you, Brenda. Cindy. Okay, I unmuted. I was just thought about the sun going backwards. It's an Isaiah thirty-eight eight. Yes, I would pay money to see that. <laughs> yeah, I'll make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz, and I went. <laughs> Oh, I'd love to see that. <laughs> Some cosmic event like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. That would be amazing. It was a suddenly. Shannon. So I'm currently in Second Kings right now, and it's it's kind of slow, right? If you're in, in, in the old, I want to go back to the Old Testament and reconnect mm -hmm. with Father God, right? I know mm -hmm. I'm with Jesus, right? But I want to connect with the old stuff. And where I'm at right now, it's like these king after kings after kings after kings. But here's what's interesting, right? The Elijah and the Elisha. And so the suddenly was Elijah went up in a chariot. And mm -hmm. then suddenly he's like, can I just please have your mantle? I just want to be doubly blessed. And mm -hmm. boom, he let, what does he leave behind? His mantle. It's mental. Suddenly puts that on and he's suddenly double blessed. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess that's a big, that's a big goosebump moment though. I don't okay. know. That's ordinary. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. Brenda, I was coming back to you. Uh, so the, uh, the disciples are walking back to Jerusalem and then suddenly Jesus joins them and they're like, well, haven't you had the news? <laughs> yes. Yes, there are so many, honestly, and those are the ones, those are the big ones. You know, when you hear one of the, an incredible minister preaching the word, we hear about all these suddenlies and all these immediatelies, and it makes us expect God to some degree to react or to respond as quickly as what we see or what we hear in scripture. Again, I know I said this before in previous times, we don't know the timeline. We don't know how much time took place. We hear a word like suddenly or immediately, and not that it did not take place, but we put our own, our own spin, our perception of what that suddenly and immediately should be for us. You know, what does that do to our relationship with God? Let's say we're praying for something specifically and we've read and we've been in, in, encouraged by all these suddenlies and immediatelies and we're praying and praying and praying and our suddenly and immediately is not happening. What does that do to us? We become dejected because we've put God in a, the delivery man. So Amazon hasn't come for two days. Yeah. Um, God doesn't love me or he's not listening. Yes. How does that hurt our relationship with God? Because then it in like almost in a friendship, it's almost like, oh, I, it, it's like, I expect something from you but you're not giving it. So therefore I don't think you're worth investing in. Mm -hmm. So it distances the relationship. Mm, nice. Good. Anyone else? Thank you, Brenda. That was really good, Brenda. That was, that was exactly almost what I was thinking, but I was thinking about, mm -hmm. I remembered back to uh, some of the darkest times and I was praying and I got really mad at God. Mm -hmm. I got really mad. Like I lost my dad. I lost my husband. Where are you? What do you do? Where, what, what am I even talking to you for? Cause you're not listening. Right? right. It tends to distance us and therefore cause doubt. Yes. In his existence, but yes. it's sexuality. That's, that's nothing could be further from the truth. Right. Right. Beautiful. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing that. Yeah, guys, I think, and I, I know I've said it before, we have to be careful when we read these incredible accounts in the, in the scripture, we naturally gravitate towards the shiny object. Mm -hmm. Those suddenlies and those immediates, they're, they're shiny objects because that's what we all desire. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure that the lens in which we're seeing God through is accurate. 
Mm-hmm. So as I was going through and studying this, I, I just just started to Google and, and comb through and commentaries and stuff. There are 165 suddenlies in scripture, 165 where it says suddenly or immediately or something along those, those you know, natures, along that term. And you can look at that and go, whoa, 165. That was my initial response. That's a lot. So then mm. it's not unrealistic then for me to expect mm. a suddenly or immediately for myself. Mm. But then God said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how many stories though, BJ, are in scriptures? Mm. And then I looked up how many stories and it was over a hundred, what, what, thousand and like one, 1,190. Mm-hmm. So then when you look at it in comparison, the suddenlies and the immediatelys are rare occurrences, mm-hmm. you know? So it just put things again in perspective for me. Not that they don't happen, they do. Mm-hmm. We all even could probably look back on our lives and see that there have been times in which God just suddenly mm-hmm. did something miraculous in our lives. But it is not it is it is not the everyday. If we are looking for it as the everyday, then we're looking at him as the genie in the bottle. Let me just rub this bottle and bam. I'm going to direct you to do this and you're going to do it. But we're going to look at just a couple of scriptures and just see how it's us being obedient to the everyday that makes those suddenlies and those immediates actually stand out. We're not going to read this one, but think about the woman with the issue of blood. Mm -hmm. That was an immediate, right? 12 years. Right. But... When we read it, we see that when she touched the hem of his garment, what happened? She was healed. Immediately. Mm -hmm. Our eyes gravitate towards that. But Mm -hmm. like Brenda said, how many obedience to just the ordinary all day, every day, did this woman have to go through in order to receive that immediate? Mm -hmm. So those... Wasn't it 12 years, BJ, she had that issue? 12 she years did. she dealt with that. That's like PCOS or something way out of control PCOS, right? Right. So 12 years, Cindy, I'm going to pop, toss this over to you. Someone who I know have dealt with chronic illness for such a long mm-hmm. period of time. Give an example. T- talk me to talk us through what this woman could possibly have gone through in 12 years to finally get to her immediate well, she would have had to have persevered through much discouragement, mm-hmm. despair, mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I felt that God didn't care, mm-hmm. you know, and that I was on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have control over th- certain things that happened to me. And then <clears throat> I knew that those things could take their toll on me physically, mm-hmm. you know, with like PTSD, with long-term effects, right? with maybe no solution or partial solutions or solutions that only work for a little while. And then you're constantly trying to mitigate changes, not realizing, you know, but I would say that it's, it's just a challenge to your faith. It really is. But the alternative is worse. It's almost like Mm -hmm. jumping off a cliff or shooting yourself. He may as well just take a loaded gun and stick it in your head. Because if you give up, Mm -hmm. then you have no help whatsoever, but you can be honest with God and say, look, uh, what am I chopped liver here? What did I do? Mm -hmm. What did I do to deserve this? Mm -hmm. I don't know why I don't know why. And I don't know what I don't know. And doctors don't know what they, what I don't know either. They Mm -hmm. don't know what they don't know. They think they do. They go to medical school and they do the best they can. God bless them. But there are points where there just are no answers. Mm -hmm. So God puts you in a situation like that. But I, I think, you know, and I'm talking to myself as I'm speaking is, God never wastes any suffering. So there's a reason for the things you go through. Mm -hmm. They may not be the shiny things that you wanted, like, Mm -hmm. you know, solve world peace, Mm -hmm. uh, come up with a cure for cancer, 
or something great. I mean, you wanted to do great things and you end up with this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, I got in the wrong line. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Right. I, I tried so hard to get in the right line. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so yes. There's a purpose in it. And God never wastes that. And he doesn't put anything on us or allow things to happen to us that he cannot provide a way for us to withstand it. Mm -hmm. And if you can't withstand it, then it's better that he just take you home than before you give up. I mean, seriously. So <laughs> I would say that she went through a lot and I don't think there should be any kind of um, <clears throat> metric like, you need to go through 12 years of this right. in order for suddenly to happen, which, you know, all of it is in timing that I have no control over. So there must be, there, there is a grander scheme in all of this that, of course, like you often say, you know, I, I'm really a bit player. You know, I, I don't have a starring role. There's nothing right. like that. I'm ordinary. I'm right. really ordinary. So you often think that ordinary plus a challenge is just like a recipe for like giving up. But mm -hmm. if you don't, if you focus all, all, all your attention on that, mm -hmm. you will forget to keep your eyes on Jesus, mm -hmm. the author and perfecter of our faith, right? because he had to do that in order to go to the cross because that was really tough. He did mm -hmm. not want to do that. Right. So he is, he is, capable of bringing me through that yeah and if you can stick it out there's a suddenly in there yeah our job I always say our job is to be faithful with the ordinary mm. you know we see scriptures that Jesus he used unschooled ordinary men he's looking for people who are faithful with the ordinary He's not looking for some incredibly grand scholar and you know you may turn out to be that. But he is not choosing you because of that. He's choosing you because you've been faithful with the ordinary. And mm -hmm. I use her as an example because it doesn't tell us what her 12 years consisted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she it changed the little pads, though. I'm sorry. Say it again. She changed the little pads. Like she had to get a lot of cloths, too. <laughs> yes, she did. But she had to be faithful. Yeah. In those 12 years that kept her going. Something yeah. kept her coming, moving towards Jesus. So she was faithful in the ordinary, even in those difficult times, those difficult days when she wanted to just give it up. Mm -hmm. She chose faith. And I want us to look at our lives in terms of the same. We're all aiming for something. We all have our, our own prayers. Yeah. God, this is what I really, my heart's desire. But he's looking back and he's going, show me that you're faithful with the ordinary. Show me I can trust you with the every day. Mm. Then that would determine if I'm going to trust you with something huge. You know, you hear people at times go, man, if I had a million dollars, I donated to blah, 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 blah. And God's like, but did you give a dollar to that stranger? You know what I mean? <laughs> can I trust you with something small? while you're trying to build for something huge. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I said in the beginning, unfortunately, we live life within the spectacular. Our whole world is all about how special can you be today? What have you done today? And as Christians, we have to fight against it. Not that we are not doing great things. We're doing great things with the ordinary. And then God breathes life into it and make it extraordinary. Mm -hmm. but it's not us building the extraordinary. But mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful because it, we can, if we're not careful, get into building the extraordinary ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because everyone else around us is doing the same. I wanted mm -hmm. us to look at David. He just, he's an interesting character. <laughs> <laughs> But I want us to see him in the ordinary. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we're first going to just read verse 7 through 11. If I can get someone to take that. Who wants to grab that? But the Lord said to Samuel, 
do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you want me to keep going? Yes, through 11. Through 11, okay. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass before Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse had, oh yeah, Shema. Is that right? Shema? Close enough. Pass by. And Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen him either. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Jesse replied, there is still one left, the youngest. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send word and bring him because we will not sit down until he comes here. Okay, let's stop there. So we're talking about, here we have Samuel. He's looking for God's chosen. You know, so he goes, he says, Jesse, God told me it's amongst your sons. I'm going to have them all walk in front of me and I'm going to find them. He didn't even present David. He was an afterthought, you know? So mm -hmm. here we have David is the one that he's actually looking for, but he rose past him, all of these people, and then he says, do you have, none of these guys are the ones. Is there anyone else? And as an afterthought, he's like, yeah, well, there's the youngest one, Cindy. I guess if you want to see her, it's like, ah. he says, okay, then we will not even sit down until he mm -hmm. gets here. Where was he? He was a shepherd boy. Yeah. He was tending to the flock, right? He was doing the ordinary. Ordinary. Oh. He's yeah. out there tending the flock. He's mm -hmm. not doing anything special. Taking the I, dog out. <laughs> take, taking the dog out. Mm -hmm. He wasn't doing anything special. He wasn't considered anything special. Mm -hmm. But in the eyes of God, he was. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we have to look at our own lives and go sometimes the ordinary everyday things that we're doing will go over the heads of everybody else. Mm -hmm. right. They would not even think about you when mm -hmm. they're considering a position or considering a situation. They'd be like, I don't know who, who could do that? I have no idea. Meanwhile, Brenda's mm -hmm. sitting right there. Mm -hmm. That makes us feel a certain way. How does that make us feel when we're completely overlooked? Oh, I have wanted to... Um... M-U-R-D-E-R, -E some people. Um, <laughs> well, at like parties, because I'll get there. And they're like, oh, what do you do? It's almost like, what do you do? And then they're measuring you towards whether you're ordinary or whether you're extraordinary, according to culture. So if you do a certain job, then you're extraordinary. So I tell them, oh, I do this. Oh, well, well they've been looking for somebody who works at Google, so I'm out. <laughs> like, and so they go over there and then you hear something is being talked about and you go, you reckon that I know exactly what you're talking about, but you've already put me in this category of the not, not good enough to talk to. So it, it hurts. And so it, may, it gives me murderous intent. <laughs> murderous intent. Okay. <laughs> yes, it does hurt, especially if you know that you're capable of doing whatever it is the job is but yet you're not even being considered for the job. And I point that out, obviously David's not here. He's not aware that he's an afterthought in dad's mm -hmm. mind at this moment, but he's just out being faithful with the ordinary. And God is showing us, I see it. I haven't forgotten. And I want us to know that God sees whatever it is we're being faithful to in the ordinary and he's not forgotten. Now let's go ahead. We're going to go, we're still in 1 Samuel, but now we're in chapter 17. And if someone can read uh, 33 through 50. I can. Thank you. But 33 through 5 zero? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy and he has been fighting He's been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been taking, keeping his father's sheep 
When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The, and this uncircumcised circumcised Phil, Philistine will only be will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The, God, the Lord who delivered me from the power of the lion and the power of the bear would deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat, he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened, David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in this, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me, you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cast David by his guards. Come here, he said, and I will give you flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack David, to attack him, David quickly ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Okay, good stuff. We well, you know this story. What stands out for you? We're going to break it down. Uh, David is given some interesting armor <laughs> to wear so that he could actually show up as the military man that he, sh he should be. Mm -hmm. But David is not, David tells him, you know what? I cannot go, almost like I cannot, pretend to be this and think right. that I'm going to actually be myself. Yes. So let me go as myself because I know, I know, like he knew who his source of strength was mm -hmm. and it was God, not whatever he was wearing. Okay, good, good. Who else? What stands out for you? What do you see? Shannon, you muted. I tend to do that to myself because I don't want to overtalk. Um, sorry, guys. I hear that, that David is using the name of the Lord before he goes out there to actually do anything. So he's lifting the glory up to God and rightfully so. Right. Um, but that's, that's what really stands out to me is that not only does he say it to Goliath, but he also says it to, I guess, as to, to Saul, he mentions that mm -hmm. maybe. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he's giving all that glory all the way around to God. Right. Okay. Stood out. Good. Cindy, anything? I just thought um, going back to what we had read just previously and leading on mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. you know how you feel like you've missed the interview or you've missed the, the audition? Mm -hmm. 
you're not going to get it. You know, I felt like I'd been late my whole life, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, you're just not in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, David was not in the right, he was in the right place for what he was doing, but he was not in the lineup. Mm -hmm. So the draft picks, he wasn't even in the lineup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it just shows the sovereignty of God that he said, oh, that guy's out there with the sheep. Everybody's standing up. We're not sitting until he gets here because it's him. He's and I'm sure that really, that really, you know, fried somebody's grits because if you, if the, the chapter that we just went into, right. he says, now what have I done? He goes up mm -hmm. to the line to be helpful and his brothers are looking at him like, eh, you know, mm -hmm. he just no good smack. And I'm sure there was a lot of, you know, um, jealousy, mm -hmm. but um, if God wants you to be there and he's chosen you, there's not a whole lot anybody's going to do to stop that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then they put the old armor on him. You know what it reminds me of is what Jesus said. You can't put new wine into old. No. Yeah. New wine into old wine skins. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause it just doesn't work. This is a whole new system I'm talking about here. So this is like an old system. Saul was supposed to have the Holy spirit, mm -hmm. but he went off the rails and he did things on his own. And so the spirit had been taken from him. Right. So almost like the, like this, his sword and his, you know, all of this stuff, this armament is just indicative of how he was going to do things his way. And this is how man will do things their way to achieve success. Mm -hmm. And David just goes and says, oh, sorry, I can't move in this stuff. It probably was like oversized. It was huge. I've read, I guess I read in some commentary, whatever, anyways. He's got a couple of stones from the river and a slingshot, and that's how he rolls. Right. And it seems so small, inconsequential, outgunned, outmanned, everything. And I think it's to show that he was relying on the spirit, mm -hmm. and the spirit came through with something that was very weak in comparison, you know, to Goliath, who was armed to the teeth, but was genetically blind. So if you mm. read this, do you remember you went through that? <laughs> yes. I've never forgotten that. Yes. So shooting him in the middle of the forehead, it, it, it might have been a little easier than what we thought. But anyways, he couldn't move very fast. So I just thought that stood out to me and that it encourages me because I always feel like I'm late. I'm not in the lineup, you know, or so, you know, God is the one that makes that choice. Right. According to the heart, you know. Right. Okay. I want us to look at the ordinary. I don't want us mm -hmm. to miss it. We think about going back to the first scripture we looked at. David was out taking care of the sheep. What mm -hmm. is his role? What does that mean? He's out taking care of the sheep. What was he doing? He's always throwing rocks at the at the predators, um, taking them to water, making sure they listen to his voice so he guides them through. He's also probably watching those sheep under the watchful eye of his sister because there's always a sister right there so yeah he's just being a kid and yes. doing what parents asked him to do I want us to look at his this is his ordinary when we mm -hmm. think of someone watching the sheep he's not just kicking back laying on the grass you know looking at the sheep and rubbing their bellies he's actually doing something and mm -hmm. I love it if we look at, he points it all out, actually, if you look in mm -hmm. verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When mm -hmm. a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck mm -hmm. it. I rescued the sheep from his mouth. When it turned mm -hmm. on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and killed it. I mean, you mm -hmm. listen to, he's basically saying, I've been in preparation for this. Yes. Yes. For a long time. Yes. He was doing the ordinary in preparation for the extraordinary. Mm -hmm. When we hear this story, we always talk about David and he got his slingshot and he, mm -hmm. oh, he popped him in. The, that's the extraordinary and it's awesome. 
but it came out of him being faithful in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. While tending his sheep. While and tending living his life day-to-day -day activities. Yes. Because yeah. he wouldn't have known how to shoot a sling straight up and sh and get to the right place if he hadn't practiced mm -hmm. through right. all these Protecting different types. sheep. He yeah. had no way of knowing that mm. this was going to be coming down the pike. Mm. None of these trained soldiers would know how to handle it. But mm. he had no yeah. way of knowing that. And we have to look back. I think we've talked about it before. God doesn't tell us in advance what's coming our way. It would terrify mm. us. But we have to trust that he is equipping us as mm. so generously always put. He's already preparing us for what's ahead. We just don't know what's ahead. Yeah. Which is why we have to embrace the ordinary. If mm. we're despising the ordinary, we're despising the very training that God is using to prepare us for the extraordinary. We'll never be able to do the extraordinary. Yeah. And it's so magical because the mundane to us is so important to him. And it just shows how limited our viewpoints and our, while we have vast and expand minds, they're so minute compared to him because we see something as mundane and he's like, baby, you can't get to home run till you go through first and second and third base. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. It's, we have to be careful that we're not so hungry to be the hero. Mm -hmm. that we're not willing to be the, st the student mm. or servant hey. or servant yeah. hey yeah that's servant. good yeah it's hard I look at the student mm -hmm. the kids that I work with at school they're at a space where why do I need this mm. why do we even have to learn this it's like they don't understand the importance of being a student because of what it's going to produce for them down the road they just mm -hmm. want Give me down the road now. Mm -hmm. Not understanding you can't handle what's down the road if you're not willing to learn and train and, and be the servant in it at this moment. Think about something in your life where you've been called to do something and honestly, you felt it was beneath you. <laughs> I think we all have those things. You just felt like, do you know who I am? It's like, we would never say those things, but come on. <laughs> It's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel like, well, I, I I could do a little bit better than this. Or mm -hmm. why are you choosing that person to do this when I it's like if we're real, we have these moments where we feel like, ah, but God let you go through it anyway. He let you sit in a secondary position, even though you were capable of a primary position. Ever been in there? Anybody ever been in that yeah. position? You know what I have to say that I used to be, as I as I re reflect on my life back living in San Francisco, working at a law firm, doing all the things before I was humbled over this last 10 years, I've been in the desert. <laughs> October yeah. makes 10 years in the desert. And I, I thought about that the other day and I'm like, thank you, Lord, because everything flipped. I mean... Now I'm, I'm, wow. Now I'm just, I'm chasing the heart of God and I'm, ch I'm chasing the face of Jesus. That's mm -hmm. all I really want to do right now. That's all I'm, that's all I'm about right now. It's so purposeful to soften and remove our ego because ego is the flesh. Mm -hmm. Amen. So if he has, you know, I had a stint uh, in Kentucky before I came out to Reno. I was unemployed for seven months. And after a while, I went and got a job back in my hometown being a waitress. Mm. And I was like, dang, you had me at Kentucky Derby and red carpets and all this glitz and glamour. Now I'm schlepping honey mustard <laughs> in my hometown. I said, really? I'm you know, here. because it was ego. <laughs> and I'm not above it. I mean, I get served at restaurants. We're not, it's a very important job. But I was like, oh, you sure? <laughs> Purposeful, purposeful, Very purposeful, humbling. I'm yeah. out here learning how to walk again. You know, I'm like, okay, I got to learn mm. how to walk again. Come on. Mm. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's just, it's an important lesson to learn. And God has to oftentimes pull us back in order to move us forward. 
we get ahead of ourselves. We get full of ourselves. And he goes, okay, I got to pull you back mm -hmm. in order to move you forward. Mm -hmm. He wants us to embrace our ordinary. Mm -hmm. It's not a condemnation. It's not, he doesn't think we're wonderful. It's not that you can't do incredible things. It's just, he's putting us in training for something we're unaware of. And yeah. he meets us in that humble space as Tabney is talking about. And as Shannon mentioned, the minute we step out of humility, he's got to pull us back. There's mm -hmm. no way David could have been, could have gotten the job done had he gotten all cocky. When he starts stating a fact, he was simply doing that. He was stating a fact. When I was out with the sheep, mm -hmm. this is what I did. And this mm -hmm. is, that's a fact. It mm -hmm. wasn't like, oh, bring it on. I got you. You know, we mm -hmm. can get cocky. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, every time you do that, you remove me from the equation. Remember, ego, edging God out. Every time we get cocky, we're removing God from the equation. And mm -hmm. he has to step in, pull us back. Now take a deep breath. Let's recalibrate. Now let's move forward. What I was re I wrote down on my paper this morning, 90% of life is ordinary. Yep. 90% mm -hmm. of life is ordinary. So if we're despising the ordinary, we're despising our life. Mm -hmm. You know. If only 10% is extraordinary, something major has happened. You can't live life at Disneyland all day, every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's exhausting. At some point, you got to come home. <laughs> so You can't have five-star meals either. Sometimes you're going to have grilled cheese or noodles or, hey, you I know. Grilled cheese cheese I hate grilled the cheese. cheese. <laughs> Graham crackers. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been out to eat in I don't know how long. The last oh meal I had was BJ, so okay. <laughs> but I want us to just look at the beauty of the ordinary, the blessing mm -hmm. in the ordinary. Some of the mm -hmm. things I wrote down, you think about the widower with the with the oil, the jar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was just an ordinary, she was taking care of her sons mm -hmm. before they died. Mm -hmm. It was ordinary and God breathed mm -hmm. extraordinary into it. You know, you think about the boy, I thought about this one today, the, the boy with his lunch, the loaves and fishes. The loaves and fish. Yes. There's a backstory that we don't see, but I think just like with David being prepared out with the sheep, this boy didn't have to share his lunch. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Right? They're out to listen to Jesus preach. And when Jesus preached, he had some long sermons. They were out in the hot sun. He, he was long been like, this is my lunch and a good ridden. Good. I hope you guys, but something had trained him to share, mm -hmm. to be giving. He didn't have to give it. So God was able to take his ordinary and make it extraordinary. You know, you look at um, the cross, going to the cross, dying on the cross was ordinary. Mm -hmm. We look at it and we go, Jesus died on the cross, and that is it. It became extraordinary in the yeah. hands of God, but the action itself was simply ordinary. Back then, it was. Then Back there were two others right next to Jesus on either side. So that was exactly, ordinary. exactly. They buried people in the tomb all the time. That part was ordinary mm -hmm. in the hands of God. Jesus coming up out of that tomb was extraordinary. Again hoping that we can see the power in the ordinary because that power gives God something to work with. Mm -hmm. That's where the extraordinary comes in. If we refuse to be awesome in the ordinary, <laughs> mm -hmm. then we would never have had a lunch for him to do the loaves and fishes. We would yeah. never have had, you know, you just look at all these incredible accounts in scripture that came out of people simply being faithful in the ordinary. So again, going back to where we started, when I say, what is it that has you every day, just ordinary and you're like, oh, cleaning my house, walking my dog, you know, going to work. See if we can find faith in the ordinary because in whatever it is that brings you 
grief all day, every day, God's training you. We may not know for what, but he's training you. There's something in Shannon having to walk that dog first thing every morning. There's something in it that's going to benefit her and going to benefit God and his kingdom down the road. We just don't know what. There's something in Brenda's job that's going to benefit her and benefit God down the road. We just don't know. Our job is to be faithful with the ordinary, giving mm -hmm. God something to work with, with the extraordinary. Does that make sense? It's beautiful. I'm yeah. just like, this is so powerful. I'm grateful. It was the dying on the cross being ordinary for me. I mean, and I knew that two different people were beside Jesus, but it never registered how common mm -hmm. that was because right. it is such a spectacle. It is, you know, what roped us into a relationship with God. And, you know, that was a task he had to, I, I mean, I'm so stuck on that. And, I, and you know, for me being a, on my own is like, answering emails, looking for grants, you know, soliciting, writing proposals, things I don't get paid for that are really, really heavy and really stressful. But that's the ordinary for me that he mm -hmm. needs. He's got to keep building my muscles in that. Right. And I, I really needed to receive that tonight. Amen. Amen. I've been using my ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> I use it and I make it I make it the best. I go on these, like at work, I go on these walks. The moment I enter work, I take care of a seven-month-old baby. Mm -hmm. And so I go, okay, Georgia, she smiles big at me. So I'm all, okay, there's God smiling at me every morning. I mean, three times a week. So then I take her to morning walks. I'm like, let's go on the neighborhood walk. And I don't put her in a harness so that she's able to just be herself, right? So right. I'm just holding her and she's excited. And we're looking at flowers and she's touching the flowers. So I take pictures of flowers, right? Or random things. And then I have a whole WhatsApp like family of many, many different people all over the globe that I send these pictures to. And a lot of people go, wow, Brenda, I see God in these things. Like wow. I see what God is doing in, you're encouraging my day. I was depressed today, but this picture came in at the right time and I'm thinking, Hey, here I am looking at random beauty. To me, I mean, this is beauty, right? But right. it's everywhere. Flowers are everywhere in these neighborhoods. And so sometimes I don't conceptualize that some people do not have this access to something so ordinary. Yes. And so as you say that, I go, yes, my job, I use, I, I've, been, I've been utilizing my job for the best. <laughs> By, by using my tiny little phone to take pictures <laughs> and encourage people elsewhere while I await for whatever God is training me to do next in, you know, yeah. Yes. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I saw this quote uh, last week said, change the way you look at things and the things you look at changes. Hmm. You know, and I really want us to change the way we look at our ordinary every day. And it will change. You know, if you're going to walk the dog, you're going to walk the dog. But if I know that I'm walking the dog with a purpose, it changes <laughs> things. Mm -hmm. It changes things. Tabney's got a lot on her on her shoulders, but she's doing it with purpose. And that will change things. It's the thing that keeps you going when you mm -hmm. want to just kind of stop and give up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this last part, I just have to share, share this. I found this, I didn't write it, but I found it probably about, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it came back to me as I was studying this this week. So I went back and pulled this poem. And um, the title sounds menacing. It says, I'm dying. That's just the title. But it just mm -hmm. made sense. It says, <clears throat> it says, first, I was dying to finish high school and start college. And then I was dying to finish college and start working. Then I was dying to get married and have children. Then I was dying for, ch for my children to grow old enough for school so that I could return to work. And then I was dying to retire. And now I'm dying. And suddenly I realized I forgot to live. Oh, oh yeah. I like that. 
but it's just, it, it, it really, it's life. Uh-huh. We're so busy trying to get to the next thing mm-hmm. that we're not enjoying the blessing of where we are right now. Mm-hmm. And that was her point. I was so excited to get out of high school so I could start college. I got to get out of college so I can get married. It's like we go from thing to thing mm-hmm. to thing. Mm-hmm. And God is saying, enjoy, embrace where you are now. Mm-hmm. Because that will never come back again. Indeed. Right. Indeed. We have so many people trying to <clears throat> live their high school years, trying to reclaim them. They don't come back. Mm-hmm. You know, when I hear people talk about, oh, my young child is always sick. Do you ever get used to this? I'm going, it's tiring, but embrace it. Because when they get older, it's something different. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to look back on those years and go, wow, I really miss that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and then what she's saying at this point, she says, and now that I am dying, Mm -hmm. I look back and realize, oh man, I forgot to live. Mm -hmm. We need to live wherever God has us, however ordinary it might be. We need to live it and love it. Mm -hmm. God moves us to the next stage of life. It's seasons. Mm -hmm. We're all going to change and go from one season to another. And at some point, all those seasons will end. But until then, God, I'm going to embrace where you have me right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, Amen. Embracing blessing in the ordinary. Mm-hmm.